Anatomy Trains is delighted to announce a brand new dissection live stream specialty class on September 18th, Lumbo-Pelvic Stability, a one-day layered dissection with Anatomy Trains author Tom Myers and master dissector Todd Garcia. The early bird price of $150 is held until September 10th. After September 10th, the price is $250. Come see the body's actual core for yourself. This course will be provided over Zoom webinar with multiple camera views, live chat, and Q&A. Visit anatomytrains.com to sign up. This episode is brought to you by the Massage Mentor Institute. Diane Metkowski, also known as the Massage Mentor, and Allison Denny, also known as Rebel Massage, have teamed up to bring you the Massage Mentor Institute. MMI is a collection of teachings and education opportunities from industry leaders around the world because your continuing education experience should be whatever you want it to be. They are building community one body part at a time, and they want you to be a part of it. Head over to the massagementorinstitute.com today to see more, learn more, and do more. Hi, my name is Allison Denny, and this is the Rebel MT Podcast, where you'll hear me forcibly colliding the worlds of anatomical jargon and humor. I believe that when you know your anatomy, the what, and you know your physiology, the how, the techniques will follow. But the loads of Latin and the gobs of Greek can make a cranium convulse. It is a little overwhelming to dip your toe into the sea of anatomical knowledge, only to find that it is a bottomless ocean. You are smart, but this is intimidating. You will get there eventually. In the meantime, let's look at things differently so that you will actually want to take a swim, or at least, Hop on a boat and take a peek at what's under the surface. So I went to a bookstore the other day with my daughter. When we got there, we wound our way back to her favorite section and got into a great conversation about books that she might like. One of the books that grabbed her attention was one that I had read, and I told her it was good, but a little on the darker side. I was trying to describe it to her without giving away too much, and this man, who I hadn't noticed but was standing close by, jumped into the conversation. I wasn't really wanting to engage with a stranger, so I politely acknowledged him and assumed that that would be that. But then he asked me what I was currently reading, so I told him, and then he asked my daughter what books she was thinking about getting, and she responded, politely. This conversation had gone on longer than I wanted, and I started to wonder what this guy was all about. Was he genuinely being friendly? Was he trying to sell me something? Was he a bookstore serial killer? I was getting kind but socially awkward nice guy vibes, though, so I gave him another moment. He eventually introduced himself and offered a hand to shake. I'm still COVID shy, so I politely offer a thanks but no thanks. We were both masked and he was perfectly pleasant about my refusal to shake hands. But then he asked me if we lived in town. And then he dove even deeper and asked me what I do for a living. And by this point, I had gone from appeasing him to wanting to run away, and I feel my insides wall up. In the midst of all this, I did reveal that I'm an entrepreneur, and he told me that he works for a big marketing company and thinks interactions like these are exactly what life is about. Because if we just travel on our own paths with blinders on, we never really meet people and make connections, and connections is what life is all about, especially considering what we both do for a living. And I agree. There's a deep philosophy here that I feel strongly about, that if we live in our own tunnels, we will never really know others, and those connections can be invaluable to us, to them, and to the community as a whole. But here is what this episode is really about. I also have a deep philosophy that there are some weirdos out there, and the world is full of interactions that can cause a lot of pain, and our response to this is to create thick layers around us that help us feel protected. This is a hard one for me because my go-to MO is to be super open and outgoing. I love hyper-friendly people and respect their bravery and ability to start conversations with strangers, so I get totally caught up in the moment. I am immediately all smiles and want to shake hands and exchange phone numbers and make new friends all the time. And this has worked out for me a bunch of times, but in other instances, it's not been so great. And I'm a woman, and I'm a mom, so I guard up. 
Back in the bookstore, I go into protection mode. Instead of answering the questions he asks with all my vim and vigor, I keep my answers short. Instead of shaking hands, I hold a boundary that feels safe. Instead of exchanging phone numbers and making a new friend and a potential new business contact, I retreat and wish him a nice day. I don't know what the right thing would have been. On the one hand, the world is so incredibly divided right now, and stories of connection and understanding are vital in healing. But on the other hand, I stayed safe. And there's not much of doing anything if we're not safe. And really, I think that we find ourselves in this pickle more often than we realize. Everyday interactions are constantly a series of decisions that we hope will be good for us. Are we out there in the world doing the things we want to do that make us happy? Or are we proceeding with caution and trying to stay safe? Are we fully mobile and articulating? Or are we guarding up and gathering layers of protection? So clearly, the parallel I want to draw here is that muscles can have the same quandary. Maybe they start off being super open and free and wanting to make friends with everyone around them. And then, because they've been hurt one too many times, they start to form strong boundaries and a firm layer of protection. Maybe they're trying to live unencumbered, but keep misstepping and finding themselves limping home. Maybe this is what muscle guarding is really about. Maybe this is how shin splints really start. Let's take a look at the two main characters in shin splints the tibialis anterior, and the tibialis posterior. The tibialis anterior is the muscle just next to your tibia, or your shin bone. It originates on the lateral condyle of the tibia and the proximal and lateral surfaces of the tibia and the interosseous membrane. What all of this means is that it's stuck pretty flatly onto the outside upper surface of your shin bone. Then it drops down and inserts onto the medial cuneiform and the base of the first metatarsal, So basically that point right at the inside edge of the arch of your foot. The tibialis posterior, as its name suggests, lays on the other side of the tibia. It originates on the proximal posterior shafts of the tibia and fibula and the interosseous membrane, so on the upper back side of the shin bone and its connecting parts. And then it weaves down, wraps around the inside of the ankle, and inserts itself onto all five tarsal bones and the second, third, and fourth metatarsals, which basically means that it branches out and sticks onto all of the little bones deep in the arch of the foot. These two ropey shin muscles hang out on either side of the tibia and manipulate what the foot does like a puppeteer and his puppets. Pulling at the strings, they team up to hike the foot into inversion, or lifting the inside arch of your foot up so that you can see if you stepped on any gum, but then they also divide and conquer. The tibialis anterior pulls the foot into dorsiflexion, or if you were to lift your toes towards your knee so that you can check out your new pedicure, and the tibialis posterior pulls the foot into plantar flexion, or if you were to point your toes down to the ground like your Cinderella trying on that glass slipper. So now, if you do all three of these actions in a row, plantar flexion and then inversion and then dorsiflexion, you've brought your foot almost into a full circle, excluding eversion. And if you think about it, that's a lot of actions for these two muscles, especially considering that the joint they are doing this to is the same one that supports all of your weight. And if you think about that, you might realize that the amount of abuse these two muscles take is pretty extreme. Running, biking, hiking, rock climbing, tennis, basketball, any sport for that matter, standing all day, standing in high heels, standing in vans, walking in flip-flops, You get my point. There are a lot of things that can go wrong with an ankle, a foot, or a lower leg. Shin splints is one of the bigger dysfunctions and the kind of thing that shows up in the lower leg because of, well, because of life. We hear about it most in association with runners because it is technically an overuse injury. But just like you don't have to be typing all day to get carpal tunnel syndrome, you don't have to be a runner to get shin splints. They are the result of a general abuse of the tibialis anterior and the tibialis posterior, both of which are just trying to do their thing, both of which just want to live their life, both of which want to go to a bookstore without having an anxiety attack. Here's how I say it. Muscles have anxiety attacks just like we do, but instead of their insides clamping down, it's their outsides that grip. The layer of connective tissue that surrounds them responds like an adrenaline rush. It tightens up 
and latches on to anything it could hold on to. In this case, the fascia that surrounds the tibialis anterior and posterior are both already stuck onto a good portion of the tibia, and as that grip tightens, it stresses out the periosteum, or the connective tissue layer of the tibia. This then begets a downward spiral of events that creates pain responses all over the lower leg, and if it gets too severe, can lead to a tibial stress fracture or compartment syndrome, the latter of which is extremely dangerous and can actually be life-threatening if an infection sets in. So basically, shin splints arise from a need to feel safe, exactly in the same way that we guard up and don't talk to strangers because we know there are risks. And as much as I wish this wasn't a reality, it is. The need to protect and guard with layers serves a very important purpose. But when it happens repeatedly over months, weeks, and even years, it can get problematic. The upside We can recognize the patterns and start to shift things. There are amazing ways in which we can talk ourselves down off that ledge when fear overrides rationality. And there are equally amazing things we can do to manage shin splints. Try this. With your client's supine on the table, begin your work into the tibialis anterior by passively plantar flexing the foot. As you guide the toes down away from the knees, this lengthens the tibialis anterior and offers a nice relieving stretch. As you let it soften by allowing the foot to relax back to a neutral position, sink methodically into the belly of the muscle, making your way up from the ankle towards the top of the tibia. Incorporate repetition into this technique, passively stretching the muscle out and then sinking in as it softens. This approach both offers a reprieve from the tension into the muscle itself while allowing a manipulation of the guarded connective tissue as it releases its grip. It's a nuanced method that offers a safety net without creating more stress. As for the tibialis posterior, instead of stretching it while you work on it, soften it first. Use a broad hand to grab the inside arch of the foot. This will calm any lingering anxiety and help it to feel like it's in confident hands. Then, turn the foot into inversion as you sink behind the medial ledge of the tibia. There will undoubtedly be some discomfort here. But as long as you are not producing a pain response, you're good to go. Let the foot relax into neutral as you release your compression into the tibialis posterior's grip on the inside of the tibia. If your client's okay with a more aggressive approach, keep your pressure into the tibialis posterior as you guide the foot from inversion to eversion. This is a beautiful pin and stretch that is subtle enough to get into this hidden muscle, yet strong enough to create a shift in the tissues. And then, with your client off the table at the end of your session, talk to them about treating these muscles with a little more kindness and a little less abuse. Talk to them about giving the tibialis anterior and posterior a little love after a long day. Some self-massage, ice, heat, some good stretches. And then, take comfort in knowing that you've helped these muscles speak up in a world where it is easy to get lost in the grips of being human. And here we are the end of the episode. Thank you to the extraordinary crew over at ABMP for helping me get my words into your ears. And if you want to get any of your words into my ears, or more accurately into my brain via my eyeballs from a computer screen, drop me a line at rebelmt at abmp.com. That's R-E-B-E-L-M-T at abmp.com. I always want to hear your questions, comments, suggestions, or salutations. Also, if you're interested in checking out anything else I'm doing, head over to rebelmassage.com where you will find all sorts of fun things to click on, like homemade organic products for your practice, cool links to continuing education classes, thoughts I have typed up and posted here and there, and other Rebel Massage dabblings. I'm impressed you've made it all the way to the end, but because you have, allow me to offer a glimpse into our next episode. Tune in next time as I bring you the story of a body worker who has built an incredibly successful business through, as he describes it, the ability to just get out there and try. Members are loving ABMP 5-Minute Muscles and ABMP Pocket Pathology, two quick reference web apps included with ABMP membership. ABMP 5-Minute Muscles delivers muscle-specific palpation and technique videos, plus origins, insertions, and actions for the 83 muscles most commonly addressed by body workers. 
ABMP Pocket Pathology, created in conjunction with Ruth Werner, puts key information for nearly 200 common pathologies at your fingertips and provides the knowledge you need to help you make informed treatment decisions. Start learning today. ABMP members log in at abmp.com and look for the links in the Featured Benefits section of your member homepage. Not a member? Learn about these exciting member benefits at abmp.com slash more.